my logo. There we go. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming today and hearing and watching this presentation. I'm really excited about it, um, and I know a lot of you are as well. But before we dive in, I just want to do a quick land acknowledgement and acknowledge that most of us here at the University of Saskatchewan and in the One Health and Wellness Office live and work in Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis and we recognize and reaffirm our relations with one another. We also recognize that we have people honestly from all across Canada joining us today, which is wonderful. Um, and just to recognize the land, ter territories and unceded territories that you may be living and working on as well. Now, um, today we're really talking about dog stress. And a lot of you who are joining us are either therapy dog handlers, service dog handlers, or service dog trainers. And one thing that we really want to focus on and think about is animal welfare and the work that these dogs are doing and, and how that can affect them. So I think this is going to be a really amazing conversation for us to really think about the dog's perspective and what they're going through often when they're working for us, right? So I'm going to turn this over to Ben, who is going to introduce our guest speaker for today. And, and he and I are going to help out with the chat or any questions that you may have. So Dr. Matchin is going to go a little bit through her presentation, and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. All right, over to you, Ben. Well, great. Uh, yeah, so I thought I'd just start out with uh, quickly explaining how the Q&A and chat will work. So I believe uh, Dr. Macon, am I saying that Mation. right? Mason. 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 Mason is going to be um, giving her presentation. And then if you type in questions to the question and answer at the bottom of your screen or the chat function, then uh, I'll help run a little Q&A after the presentation with her. So we can hopefully get through as many questions as we can. Uh, if your question wasn't answered, you can send me an email at ben.carry at usas.ca and I will try to get that information to you. Uh, but yeah, I'm really excited to welcome you all here to uh, this webinar to how to deal uh, with your dog's stress. I have probably the most st stressed, anxious dog in the world. So I have been so excited for this webinar. I, I can't even begin to explain. But um, Dr. Mason got her uh, uh, doctorate of veterinary care at the University of Guelph. She has a PhD at the University of Saskatchewan. She's done uh, work on uh, physiology and stress of not only uh, dogs, but also uh, in my, um, undergraduate in my uh, ornithology class, I was just talking to her about this. I actually referenced her in a couple of my uh, undergraduate papers, which I think I did okay on. I'm not entirely <laughs> sure, but she has a just a wealth of knowledge about not only dogs, but all animals. And uh, she is in the process of uh, setting up a behavioral service at the um, Western College of Veterinary Medicine, which is just something that is so needed and so fantastic. But, uh, you know, just, I guess we just got to hand it over to her and, and let her tell you herself and uh, take it away, Dr. Mason. Great. Thank you so much. And I'm so excited to be here and thank all of you for making time out of your busy day to um, join me. And so I'm going to take you through and I have to, of course, I didn't figure this out ahead of time. How to advance my slides. Oh, there they are at the bottom. Okay. All right. So before we talk about what to do about it, we need to understand a little bit about stress. So let me take you through this rather complex uh, diagram. So on the left-hand side, stressor. So stressor is anything that your body responds to that creates a stress response and changes your physiology. So it sets in motion a whole bunch of uh, metabolic changes so that you can deal with the stressor. But it's really important to know, we tend, as people, we always say that stress and this response is a negative thing, but it's not. It can also be a positive thing. So, you know, the dog getting his nail trims, yes, that's a stressor. That may create some anxiety and fear in this dog, and we'll talk a whole lot about this. But a stressor can also be 
excitement. It can be a good thing. So because your body needs to change its physiology, when you throw the ball for your dog, he needs to be able to increase his heart rate, his respiratory rate, his blood pressure. Glucose needs to be mobilized to his muscles so that he can run and chase and go and get that ball. So, so keep that in the back of your mind that stress is not always a bad thing, okay? But it definitely can be a bad thing. And as I said, we, it can incite anxiety and fear. Um, and depending on how we deal with it, how we cope with it at the end of the day, um, is important. And so we have a couple of hormones, which you may have heard the names of, adrenaline and cortisol that become in, involved that, that make these physiological changes that allow us to cope, allow us to run away, make some distance between us and whatever is making, you know, is, is stressful for us, or helps us to enjoy the situation, right? Sex is also a part of this pathway. So just kind of keep that in mind. It's not always bad. And these physiological changes are normal, okay? But I do want to break down some of the emotions that our pets can be perceiving and they're the same emotions that, that we perceive, right? And so anxiety, anxiety, we think of anxiety again as being a bad thing, but again, it can be both good and bad. It is important for survival. So if you're walking at night through a forest and there's branches on the ground, it's probably not a smart thing to run through the forest as fast as possible because you can trip. And so you will experience some anxiety about what you're stepping on. You're gonna worry a little bit about those branches because it's important for your survival and, and your health not to do it too fast, to tread carefully so that you don't hurt yourself, right? But absolutely, anxiety can get out of proportion. And it's related. Anxiety is about what might happen, not what is happening, but what might happen. I might trip on that branch and that's lying on the ground and I might fall and hurt myself. And that's why it's important for survival. And, but anxiety can definitely get out of control and, and create some problems in both ourselves and our pets, right? And so, and part of it is, is because it's, it's in, it happens in situations where we can't control things. So for this dog, his owner is holding on to his paw. She's going to trim it. We know what's going to happen. We know that we're going to trim the dog's nails. The dog doesn't necessarily know because you are probably going to touch your dog's paws for many different reasons, right? So the dog is like, I don't know what's going to happen. What are you doing? Oh, you've got the clippers, so it might hurt me, right? So it's not about what's happening, but it's all the things that your mind goes, all the places your mind goes to, right? A dog that isn't coping well with anxiety is a dog that is hypervigilant. So they're always looking around and like, oh, what might come out from behind that tree? What might happen when I see that dog walking past the window? all of those things about what might happen, right? So a dog that is hypervigilant, doesn't tend to sleep well, tends to use you as a security blanket, so will follow you around a lot. That is a dog that shows up a lot of anxiety behaviors. I wanna talk briefly about kissing. And part of the reason for talking about kissing is that in the picture I showed you of that dog, right? The dog is licking the owner's hands. And so I just want this, and. And the reason for talking about this is because this can be a, a cue for you to try and figure out what's going on in this situation. So dogs don't kiss, dogs lick. Only humans kiss, all right? So, so let's, so, but licking can have several meanings for your dog, right? The one we kind of associate kissing or licking with is attention seeking, right? The dog is happy to see us, they wanna interact with us, they're licking us because they're so excited, right? They might lick you in that situation. It's still attention seeking because you taste good. So you've gone out for a run, you're all sweaty, you come back, you got salt on your skin. And so they're like, oh, that's kind of interesting. I'm gonna lick you. But they're also seeking more information in that, right? So another reason is I'm worried, right? So in this situation, the owner is gonna trim his nails. She's holding on to his paws and the dog is like, oh, wait a minute. I'm a little worried about this. I, some anxiety is kicking in. I need more information. What are you doing? to my paw, exactly, right? And with that can be conflict. So I like you, 
but I really don't want you to trim my nails. And I don't know any dog that enjoys a nail trim, right? It can mean, it can also mean I like you. I don't want to bite you. Please stop that. Okay. And then the last thing can be reconciliation. So, but this occurs only after biting. So this is a dog that cares about the relationship and it's the aggressor that bit the victim that does the licking, right? So it can happen between dogs. It can be happening between dogs and people. And so they're like, I like you. I care about our relationship. I'm sorry you made me bite you. Not I'm sorry for biting you, but I'm sorry you did that. Please don't do it again. But that dog in that situation will absolutely bite again. Okay, so it's reconciliation after biting. So, so don't look at it as a sorry if it ever happens. Hopefully it never happens. But just so you know the kind of the four major reasons why licking might occur and it might help you interpret a situation. All right, um, fear. So fear is about what is happening at that specific moment in time. It increases survival, right? If we're fearful of things, we try to run away, right? Another thing that we need to kind of keep in mind is that um, fear and pain, anxiety, fear and pain all can interact. And this is important to understand, especially as your dog ages and they might get osteoarthritis or when your dog goes to the veterinarian, they may be um, anxious and fearful about what might happening or happen to them or what is happening. And pain can, can become important in this situation. So if your dog has a lot of anxiety and fear when they go to the vet clinic and you take them in for vaccinations and then the veterinarian gives them their vaccination and they freak out like the veterinarian has just stabbed them with the biggest knife on the planet, that's because pain, anxiety, and fear all work through the same neurological pathways. And so anxiety and fear can make pain worse and likewise, pain, if an animal is already in pain, so if they've hurt themselves and you're taking them to the vet because they need to be helped, that pain that they're experiencing can make their anxiety and fear worse in this situation. So just something to keep in mind um, as, you know, with your interactions with your own dog, because they, they can absolutely make things worse. All right, our normal response to fear is to increase the distance between ourselves and whatever is making us fearful, right? And there are three ways that, that we go about it. The first way is, is to freeze. So if you look at the dog in the upper left, he's crouching, you can see his muscles are tense and he's getting ready to run. So he's assessing the situation and going, okay, what do I need to do in this situation to get myself out of it? But unfortunately, and it is happens both in people and in, in our pets, um, freezing can also mean learned helplessness. So if you look, and I'm sorry the pictures are, are dark, but if you look at the dog on, on the right, he's, sit, he's on the chair. The first picture is him on the chair and he's looking down and he's, he's fearful. He's like, I, and probably anxious too, because these can occur at the same time that he doesn't want to jump down. He's worried about what's going to happen when he jumps down he, or he's just so fearful that he doesn't want to get off this chair. And so the next picture of him is he's sitting there and he's kind of looking okay, but he's given up. And so he can't resolve the situation because he's so fearful. And so he's given up. And so sometimes when an animal is so fearful, they look like they're coping. They look like they're doing okay. So a veterinarian, you take your dog to the veterinarian and he's so petrified and frozen in fear that the veterinarian can do anything that they want to them. That can mean that your dog is helpless in that situation, doesn't know what to do, and they're just frozen in fear. So something to keep in mind, right? And what we normally associate with fear is the flight fight reaction, right? So how to increase distance between whatever is making me fearful is to run away from it, right? That is a normal response. The other thing that, that can happen is fight, right? And so if you can't escape something that makes you fearful 
and you can't run away, that means you might have to fight it. But dogs don't, I mean, animals don't want to fight because if you fight, you might get hurt and you might die, right? So again, about survival. So there's a lot of posturing, growling, snarling, lunging, all kinds of things that can happen long before they get around to actually biting. But it depends on the intensity of what's making them fearful. So if the intensity is low, then they're gonna do a lot of that posturing. But if it's right there in their face and they're just so frightened to death and they, the only way they think of getting out of that situation is to fight, then they absolutely will act and you can go very quickly from zero to 60. All right, frustration. This is another emotion that we really don't talk about a whole lot. Okay, so in situations, again, just like anxiety and fear, this is important for survival. It means frustration is about not giving up. Frustration sits on the rage and anger pathway in your brain. So for example, you go to a vending machine and you put some coins in and the treat that you wanted, you're really hungry and it doesn't come out, well, what happens? You start rocking the machine or you hit the machine, right? Because it sits on your anger pathway. But at the same time, you're like, I really want that. I'm not going to give up. And if you think about an animal in the wild, right? If they didn't catch the rabbit for dinner the first time and they give up, they're going to starve to death, right? So frustration is important about doing it again, trying over and over because being successful is important to your survival. So frustration is about unmet expectations, right? I expected that that you know bag of chips to come out of the vending machine, it didn't. And inability to control the situation. I can't control that vending machine more than what I'm doing right now. So sometimes you can see animals as well as people acting out because of this frustration and, and its pathway to anger. There are barriers that are important in the frustration pathway. It can be emotional, it can be fear and anxiety that plays into this. I'm afraid, but I'm also frustrated that I can't get out of here, right? If you think about the domestic dog, it is actually the picture of frustration. We decide when you eat. We decide when you get to go outside. We decide when you play. We decide how long your walk is going to be, right? And so a physical barrier can be a dog on a leash. A dog can't run away from something that it's fearful about because we have that dog on a leash or they're behind a fence and they really want to interact with something or they really want to scare the dog on the other side of the fence, but there's a barrier in between them. And then there can also be physiological, so pain. Pain can be a physiological barrier. I really want to run and jump and play, but I can't because it hurts, right? So frustration is an important emotion that our dogs will experience and we need to, there are some things that we can do to reduce frustration. All right, so now we kind of know about emotions and some of the physiological pathways associated with this. Let's talk about recognition. All right, so if generally it's better not to anthropomorphize, although you can a little bit, right? So we tend to know when our dogs are happy. We tend to know when they're worried and sad, but we don't know how they're interpreting that situation. So try not to interpret as much as possible, but I will tell you, I am guilty for sure. I absolutely say my dog is happy right now. And really I should just be looking at their, their body language. So I'll forgive you because I forgive myself for making, for making those assumptions. All right, but when we look at these two pictures, there's one dog that we would want to interact with and there's probably the dog on the right that we might not want to interact immediately with because his expression maybe tells us that he's not okay with the situation. And as a matter of fact, there was a really cool study that was done in the UK a number of years ago where they took pictures of dogs, their facial pictures and in certain situations, and then they showed them to people who own dogs and people who didn't own dogs. And they found that people were actually pretty good at interpreting whether or not this dog was happy, whether they were worried and so on. I mean, very, very rudimentally and they were right about 80% of the time. It's important to note that they were wrong 20% of the time. So you can't always rely on facial expression. And this just goes back to the fact that the dog has evolved 
as our companions and being in our in, in in our communities for long periods of time. They read our faces, they look to our faces all the time, and we also read their faces. So this is a relationship that has developed over centuries. Okay. But there are other signals that are worth knowing and paying attention to. So there are lots of signals where the dog tells us they're not comfortable in a situation. And these are called displacement behaviors. They're unconscious behaviors. They are normal behaviors, but out of context. And because they are normal, we tend to miss them. Okay, so look at the picture of this woman. She's biting her nails, right? Biting your nails is normal behavior if you want to shorten your nails. But if we look at where she's sitting, she's sitting in an airport. So she may not be conscious of the fact. I mean, you don't sit there in an airport and go, oh my gosh, I'm nervous. I better bite my nails, right? You don't think about it. It just happens if you're one of those people that uses this as a coping mechanism, right? Dogs do this too but their signals are a lot different. All right, so I'm gonna take you through a number of different things. Lip licking, when there is no food and water present, they just do this little tongue flick or a lip lick. Yawning, when they're not tired or when they didn't just get up. Squinting or blinking a lot when there's not a lot of sun in their face, right? I mean, you can argue the dog on the right, there might be sun in his face, but the dog on the left is in the shade. Why is he squinting? And he's also yawning, All right? A whole head and body shake when they're not wet or if they don't have a lot of dirt in them. Stretching when they didn't just get up for, from a nap. Shifting back and forth, lifting a paw can be an indication that they're stressed. Signals can be panting. So if they're panting when it's not hot, smiling, dogs don't smile. They either growl or they have this rather bizarre looking face and it looks really cute, but it actually means that they're stressed. Sneezing when they don't have something up their nose, huffing and puffing in situations looking from the corner of their eyes. So the guy on the left, he's not looking, he hasn't turned his whole face to look at what's making him nervous. He's looking just from the side of his eyes. He's got his nose pointed in a different direction. That's a dog that's thinking about, do I need to escape right now? All right, so if we look at the little, um, the little girl who's hugging the dog, we could probably look at the face of that dog and go, oh, that dog isn't comfortable. But there are those signs that we were talking about. So the ears are back. We have this whale eye or half moon because the dog isn't looking directly in front of itself. The mouth is also quite tight. It's not relaxed. The dog on the right, ears back, whale eye, lip licking, right? So these things are occurring together. And when they occur together, that indicates that there is a problem, that this dog is not comfortable in this situation. Conflict behavior. When a dog is not sure about the situation, they will give mixed signals. So the dog on the left, you can already see the lip lick. So you should start going, oh, maybe there's something not quite right here. The dog wants the treat, but he doesn't want the human. A dog like this, will often come and go. So they'll come towards the human and then they'll back away. Or sometimes they'll circle. They'll go around and around because they're not sure about the situation. I want it, I want the biscuit, but I really don't want the person. A dog who barks and wags his tail. Wagging your tail means I wanna interact. Barking, bark, dogs bark as a warning system. So it's, it's not clear cut. It's two different emotions at the same time. I want it, but I don't want it. All right, so what does this all mean? All right, so it, if you look at the green, right? Low arousal, arousal just means readiness, right? So normal behavior, the dog at the bottom, he's got relaxed ears, his mouth is open and relaxed. He's got a different type of smile than the one I showed you earlier, right? So sometimes we look at that and we see a smile, but it's, the grimace that I showed you earlier was the stress smile. The eyes are relaxed. This dog, we might look at him and say, he looks, he looks pretty good. He looks happy. Okay. 
And so this dog is below the emotional threshold. And when we start seeing those displacement behaviors that I talked about, right, all those signals and these or these conflict behaviors and or, um, then we're starting to get in above the emotional threshold. So we have the dog, the pug that's got a lip lick. He's doing one thing. Maybe he's squinting as well, but it's hard to know if it's if it's not because he's out in the sun, right? So he's doing one thing. Really what you're like, if you reach out and you touch your dog and he gives a lip lick, that's not a big deal. Don't think that your dog hates being petted. We'll talk about, about petting in a minute. But when you see clusters, when there's more than one of them that's happening at the same time, the dog on the right, ears back, whale eye, lip licking, turning his head away, those are all signals that a dog is not comfortable, right? And so if left unchecked, if the situation doesn't change, those emotions, fear, anxiety, and frustration, and again, they can all interact together, they start moving the dog towards this threshold, this behavioral threshold. So they can have reactivity, they can give warning signs and escape movements, right? They want to change their situation so that they're, they're not in that situation anymore. Okay, so you're thinking, oh my gosh, she's told me a lot of information. I've seen some of these behaviors and, and let, I'll just tell you that after this, this seminar, you're going to start seeing those behaviors in your dog. Don't think, oh my God, my dog's behavior is getting worse you're just getting better at seeing these signals, all right? So, so don't, don't panic when you start seeing them. All right, so how do you know if it's good or bad? How do you know if we're escalating on above that emotional threshold that we're getting into that, into that red zone, that behavioral threshold? Well, one way is to, is to kind of keep an eye on interactions or situations that you put your dog in, right? What is their recovery time? So for example, a recovery time should be like if someone walked up behind you and scared you, right? You should go, ah, and then realize, oh no, it's okay, I'm all right, you know? And it'll be a few seconds. Your heart rate might've gone up because you have a little bit of adrenaline pumping through you, right? If it's a really bad situation, right? You might, you might get a little nervous, but if it's, but you should recover, you should calm down. You should go, oh, okay, the situation's not so bad, I'm okay. So look at recovery time. If your dog shows those, those displacement or conflict behaviors, do they then come back and calm down? Can they settle? Are they sleepy after a walk or an interaction? Or do they remain hypervigilant? Do they remain restless and agitated for long periods of time? And if so, then we know that whatever that was is not good, all right? And so now we have to think about ways of dealing with it. Another way to assess is if your dog you know, if you train your dog with treats and your dog takes treats and now your dog isn't taking treats, aha, there's something wrong. My dog is not comfortable in this situation. If you have a dog that isn't comfortable taking treats, do they wanna play? Do they respond to commands? If you ask your dog to sit and your dog is pretty darn good at sitting every time and all of a sudden they're blocking you out, they're too busy staring at something that's upsetting them, or too busy trying to hide or freezing or whatever, and they're not wanting to interact with you, that tells you this situation is not a good situation and I need to do something to help my dog. So what can we do? Well, first of all, let's talk about prevention. And I know that you know pretty much everybody here has a dog, but maybe in the future you will get another dog or maybe you're thinking of adding a dog to your family. First thing is socialization. So socialization just means exposure to low level stress so that the dog can recover and habituate to it. Habituate just means it, it becomes a normal part of their environment and they don't care about it. So think about it, you know, you take your, your puppy to the vet to get vaccinated, think about this as a stress vaccine that we're, we're and the way to do it is you expose them to low level stress multiple times and for a new a puppy between 12 and 16 weeks, you're talking about two hours a day. This does not mean two hours of constant stress and then they'll be okay on the other side. This means over a two hour day, you're gonna take your dog for a walk so he gets out into the environment and experiences things. Maybe you're gonna go, okay, well, I want my dog to be used to cars. So I'm gonna you know, walk towards a busy road so that my dog starts getting used to 
sounds in the environment and things like that but don't rush it take your time go slowly like i say this is low level stress and pair it with positive reinforcement so give your dog treats if your dog looks at a cyclist going by because cyclists and skateboarders and things that come out of nowhere can be scary for dogs right so we want to go oh did you see that cyclist that went by here's a treat for you create that positive association it's really important to avoid punishment. And for a number of different reasons. First of all, it creates conflict between you and your dog, right? Your, your, your dog is sitting there, well, I like you, but all of a sudden you're doing something I don't like, right? So we wanna decrease the amount of conflict between us and our animal. And most importantly, it doesn't convey what they're supposed to do in that situation when we punish them. And so I, you know, I go back to uh, my son, he played soccer for a number of years and he was so good. I love going to his soccer games. He was really excelling at it. And then one summer he ended up with a coach and after every game, the coach hauled them all into the, into the change room. And while they were getting changed, he spent at least an hour telling them all the things they did wrong. Not once did he say, don't do that, do this. He just told them what not to do. So my, so the kids all had to experiment. They had to go, well, he told me not to do that. So I'm going to try this. And then they would fail. So basically when you use punishment, you're setting your dog up for failure because they don't know what they're supposed to be doing them to, to be doing. Right. So really important to tell them what you want them to do as opposed to what you don't want them to do. And I'm not saying we're, that any of us are perfect and we're never going to use punishment. We're never going to, you know, be a, impatient or whatever, but minimize punishment as much as humanly possible because it creates fear, anxiety, and frustration. And that summer was my, my kid's last soccer season. He couldn't do it anymore. He was so frustrated. He was so angry. He was, he was just not enjoying it. He said, why would I do it if I'm not enjoying it? And I was disappointed because I, I really enjoyed watching him play soccer. The other thing with punishment is that it can also decrease the likelihood of those warning signs when you're those signals where your dog starts telling you that something is wrong right and so one good example is a friend of mine um they they agreed to um incorporate a dog into their family and the dog had been punished for growling so when she had was worried in certain situations when she really you know all those signals and she you know she got to that behavioral threshold where she was just, I can't deal with this anymore. And she would growl to let the owner know the owner punished her every single time she growled. So when my friend got this dog, they got a dog that skipped the growling and went to a bite. And so that was a really problematic situation. And just, you know, dealing with people and in behavioral consults, I can tell you that, you know, the guy who come put a shock collar on to try and decrease aggression, it didn't improve that dog's behavior. And they, you know, they always tell me it just, di it didn't help at all. And then there was a study that was done a number of years ago that showed that when people use punishment, so it can be anything from yelling to alpha rolling them to picking up their dogs and shaking them or hitting them or putting prong collars or electric collars on them, that 43% of dogs turn on their owners with aggression. Right, so it definitely doesn't help your relationship. So we need to create positive associations with things that are worrisome to our dogs. We've talked a little bit about, you know, start early. And even if you don't get a puppy, if you get an older dog, you can still introduce them to things, but create positive associations, get them excited about trees, get them excited about a toy and use those in, in a situations to go from something they may see as bad and make it good, right? So if you're in a situation and all of a sudden you're seeing a number of things, your dog is lip licking, you know, this dog is showing, well, I is really not comfortable with this person reaching towards them. And I know that, that you, you know, for service dogs, you don't want people touching the dog, but people will still reach out regardless, right? And the best thing to do is just remove them from the situation and then think about how you can change your dog's emotional experience when they're in the same situation again, because it's always gonna happen, right? There are things in our environment 
that we need to desensitize our dogs to. So what does that mean? That means that we're going to expose our dog to the thing that makes them show some of these signals, the things that's stressful for them, and we're going to try and make them habituate to it. We want them to be okay with whatever it is, right? So let's say thunder, because some dogs really hate thunder. All right. And thunder is a bit complex because there's barometric changes and things like that. But let's just talk about the noise of thunder. All right. Not, not all those other things that come along with it. So one of the ways that we desensitize a dog to thunder is that we get the owner to, you know, you, oh, YouTube is great because you can find <clears throat> the pictures don't matter. Right. At, at, at least to start. But you can find thunder. You can find thunder on, on the internet. And so you can turn it up. You can turn up the volume slowly. So what we ask our owners to do is to, is to slowly over time, increase the volume. And at the same time, they're gonna feed their dog a bone or a rawhide or a chew or a frozen Kong, put stuff in the Kong and then freeze it. So they're gonna work on it for a bit. So we're trying to create a positive association. Something good happens to them when thunder's around, they get all this fun stuff to chew on. And chewing is also very relaxing to dogs, help bring that anxiety level down. So, so you're gonna sit there and, and only 15 to 20 minute sessions and slowly turn up the volume. And so when your dog goes, oh, wait a minute, I hear something and the food isn't enough to keep me distracted, what is going on? So they might look to you or they might look at where the noise is coming from, that's your threshold. Right, that's where our dog went from being okay to not being okay. And then we're gonna back it off a little bit and we're gonna work sub, sub threshold and then we're slowly gonna increase it. And in between, we have to wait for our dog to go back to eating. We can talk to our dog, we can comfort our dog, we can give our dogs some more treats. And when they're ready to start again, that's when we start turning up the volume a little bit. And then we, and so the idea is that these sessions, 15 to 20 minutes at the most, we're looking for calming down happens in between faster. And also that you can raise that volume. And so that is a desensitization process. The counter conditioning part, you may have heard desensitization and counter conditioning is the part where you change the emotional experience. It now becomes a good thing to be around whatever's noisy, right? You can do it towards anything basically in the environment, but it's really important that you control the environment. So for example, if your dog is fearful with strangers, then what you do is you go, you borrow a good neighbor and you get them 200 meters away and you say, you stand there and you look at for your dog for those signals. Or is my dog showing signals? No, I can walk a little bit closer. And you give your dog treats every step of the way. And then when your dog's head goes up, you go, oh, okay, the threshold is 100 meters. Now I need to work on moving closer. So there's all kinds of things that you can do. And hopefully some of the trainers will be able to help you um, with this if you have any issues, right? Okay. Another way to decrease anxiety for our pets is to give them cues, is to tell them what is going on. Remember, when you take your dog for a car ride, he doesn't know if he's going to the vets, if he's going to the dog park or a friend's house or a long trip. Your dog has no idea what's going on. We can't really communicate them long ride, short ride, vets or things. I mean, maybe your dog will recognize the word vets. But there are things that we do to our dogs every day that have the potential to create anxiety and fear in our pets. So what do we need to do? We need to tell them what's gonna happen. If you're gonna pick up your dog, say, pick up, and then pick up and give them a treat. Remember, we also wanna make it a good experience. If you just pick them up and you say, pick up, pick up, you know, it's okay. Your dog doesn't need to like it because you're telling them. And this, these, having these predictable cues will absolutely decrease their fear and anxiety. But if we want them to be better at it, if they want them to be happy about it, then we're gonna also pair it with something that tastes good. And these predictable outcomes will really help. All right, so we can do it for picking up, you know, picking up your dog's paws and wiping them in the spring when they're coming in and it's wet and muddy and you wanna wipe your dog's paws. But remember they have four paws. It's actually even more helpful 
if you number the pause or if you use right left for front and one two for back but you but only do it if you remember which dog is which paw is which command right because you can't change them you need to always be the same the right paw always needs to be the right paw and if you can't remember right from left then go one two or just say front paws or back paws and again you can pair it with a treat and dogs that start to understand this a dog where you say pick up and you lower it will actually jump into your arms when there's a positive association a dog that understands that I'm gonna wipe your right front paw will, when you say right, is gonna lift that paw and give it to you, right? And so this is a dog that begins to understand what's going on in the environment, right? Same with grooming, if you wanna brush your dog. The cue doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to brush you. You don't need to necessarily say it, you can, but the cue is often the brush itself, right? So there's all kinds of ways where we can tell our dogs what is going to happen to them. If you're gonna go on a bus ride, before you get on the bus, go bus and pair it with a treat. You can start by just watching the bus go by and then giving them treats before you actually get on the bus and all kinds of things like that. So the more that we can tell a dog what will happen to them decreases fear, anxiety, and in many cases, frustration. Okay, consent. We can also give our dogs the ability to say yes and no. So consent means that everybody agrees. Now, we, when we give our dog cues, it doesn't mean that they have to like it. It just helps them understand what's, I mean, it does not matter how many times I say nail trim or show them the nail trippers or bath that my dog goes, oh yeah, this is the greatest thing in the world. Many of, most of my dogs are like, no, I see the nail, I have one dog who sees the nail clippers and she's like, I'm out of here. I don't want anything to do with those things. And I'm like, too bad, we have to trim your nails. That's an important part of your care. You have to have your nails trimmed. So I'm not gonna be able to overcome it. So it doesn't, but when we get to consent, it means that my dog has to agree to participate. And so one thing is touch, right? Some dogs don't like to be touched. Some dogs like to be touched, but they don't like to be surprised that they're gonna to be touched. So touch consent is about, you can say, do you want a pet? And allow your dog to say no, because that allows them that control over their environment, right? Remember that frustration comes from not being able to control their environment and anxiety can be part of that as well, right? Not being able to control the situation, not knowing what's gonna happen. And so we can definitely improve our dog's emotion by saying, do you want a pet? And if they don't run away, then we can pet them. Or another way to tell whether or not your dog wants to be petted is to touch them. Tell them, do you want a pet? Touch them and move your hand like an inch away. And some dogs will go, oh yeah, hang on. And they'll, and they'll lean right into your hand and go, oh yeah, that was good. Keep going, don't stop. So there's all kinds of ways that we can figure out what our dog is thinking, right? So if you're gonna do consent, again, it comes back to everybody agrees to participate and you have to accept a no if you're okay with that. So the dog in the middle, this dog is not going to consent to having his hair cut, right? So how do we change that? Again, we can get consent by making it more positive. We can use a lot of treats. Here's just showing them the scissors. Here's a treat, things like that. Sometimes you will never get over, you know, but them not liking it. But I had talked to you about, about um, something that, that we can work around as well. And then the dog on the right is relaxed, doesn't mind being hugged like this. This is a good thing to train for dogs going to the veterinarian where they might need to use restraint. All right, cooperative care. This is a mix of, of doing things to animals where they're not so happy about it, but allowing them to make decisions about their own care. And zoos have been doing this for a long time. They figured it out a long time ago that I cannot force a polar bear to do something he doesn't like. The only way, or it used to be, that they would anesthetize them each and every time they needed to do something to them. 
Well, that there was a whole lot of risk that came with that, right? Having to anesthetize an animal every single time you need to do something. And there was a never negative experience, right? Having to be injected by something, not knowing what was going on. And it really, I mean, a lot of keepers reported seeing a decline in their animals' welfare. And so what they started doing was cooperative care. So there is nothing holding this polar bear in place. And yet he's staying there. He's choosing to participate in his own care. And the way that it happens is that they use this consent. They allow the animal to say yes, and they allow the animal to say no. And when an animal can choose to participate or not, it reduces stress and fear because the animal is in control. It increases their confidence and tolerance and animals will choose more often to participate even when the procedure is unpleasant or aversive. And I encourage you, you know, to just put in cooperative care in zoos into um, YouTube and you will find these amazing videos of what, you know, apes that allow blood samples to be taken and they yelp when the needle goes in, but yet they stay there and it fully by their own choice. We can do this with our own animals as well. The yes signal is like this dog on the, on the right at the top. Hopefully you can see it. He is placing his chin on the pillow. That's the yes signal. Yes, I'm okay to continue. But he also is not being restrained. He gets the option to remove himself and that is the no signal. And when he says no, it's like, okay, if you don't want to participate, again, come back to the polar bear. If that polar bear walks away and says, I'm not participating anymore. There is nothing you can do about it unless you want to anesthetize it, right? So just think of the polar bear. So, you, you know, and it takes a long time or not a long time, but it takes a while to get your dog habituated and be able to make it through. But you can absolutely do it. Hopefully some of your trainers are, are um, are accustomed to this. If not, there are trainers. There's lot. There's actually lots of great YouTube videos on how to train your dog. And it's about communication, telling them what's going to happen. You can simulate things like a physical exam. You can pre prepare them. You know, if your dog has ear, um, ear needs ear drops because of infections or eye drops because of so on, you can prepare them for the necessary treatments. Sometimes you can hold off on treatment while you get them to a point where they're okay with being willing to accept treatment. So, I mean, I cannot say enough about cooperative care. Um, you can prepare your dog for vet visits. There are, you know, a fear-free or a low stress handling movement that's kind of going through the vet community. You can look for veterinarians who are, are able to do this. Um, you know, if your dog already knows how to lie down and on his side for an examination of his paws, then tell your veterinarian so that they're not forcing the dog into a position, right? You can ask your, your veterinarian for a happy visit where your dog can go and, and, and you can desensitize the event to an extent. The vet clinic is always gonna be bad. Bad things always happen at the, at the vet clinic, right? And so you can't make them love it, but you can, you can make it so that they will tolerate it and decrease that fear and anxiety, right? And if you can't, if you already have a dog that is so fearful, then talk to your veterinarian about pre-visit pharmacology. So get some drugs on board so that they are just not having to experience all that anxiety and stress. And I mean, if need be, they can knock them completely out. There are some dogs that just cannot, you know, tolerate a nail, a nail trim. Okay, well, why? You don't need to be completely conscious. And there are some very safe drugs for this. But there are also stop and goes at the clinic. If the dog stops eating, that's a signal that maybe we need to stop what we're doing. It may be expensive to do it that way. More training up front will help, but something to consider. All right, I just briefly want to talk about trainers. You want a trainer that understands learning theory principles, that they know about positive reinforcement, that they don't use aversive tools and punishments. It's great if you're trainer has some kind of um, training that they've done and they've demonstrated knowledge. So a CPDT is a, um, 
Oh gosh, it's left my brain at the moment, but it's a, a dog trainer. The KA is knowledge assessed. Um, there's an organization that they have to join and then they have to maintain their education over time. But really you want someone who focuses on reinforcing desirable behaviors and avoid, and they don't use those aversive tools and um, absolutely avoid a, a board and train situation being away from you in an unfamiliar um, situation can increase fear, anxiety, and frustration because they don't know what's happening. You know what's happening, but they don't know what's happening. And many of those facilities that offer board and train also use aversive tools. So you don't get to control what's happening to your dogs. All right, so thank you. Um, I hope that was okay. And I am more than happy to uh, take questions. Thank you so much, and that was so informative. That was lovely. I do have a few questions rolling in, and uh, anybody that would like to ask questions, please use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. That's the easiest thing. That way I can tell um, when questions are coming in. I can tell when we've answered them. Super easy. Uh, the first question here for you is, uh, so if adrenaline and cortisol are released during experiences of stress or excitement, and high levels of these hormones can negatively affect our dogs and us, does this mean that we should limit both our and their stress and excitability to keep these levels of hormones uh, lower? That's an excellent question. So um, yes and no is my answer. So adrenaline and cortisol are important for preparedness, right? Getting you ready for exercise. A dog goes to play agility. They get super excited when they get there. I can get there was a paper that was actually done a number of years ago where they measured cortisol, salivary cortisol, and it went up. Well, guess what? They were excited. They were preparing to go and play. This was fantastic. The hormone is there for a reason, right? It's bad. These hormones are bad when they're extended periods of time and they don't come back down. That is when those hormones are bad. And the way to make sure that though you get that recovery is through exposure. So people who raise puppies and expose puppies from like day one, they, they like tip them upside down for like two to three seconds. That's a stressor that will raise cortisol, but it is that vaccination to a stressor, have being in a different position than normal, or they'll put, they'll touch their puppies pads to an ice cube for a second. Oh, that's cold, that's a stressor but that's a vaccination against that stress. So exposing your dog to low level stress periodically, and especially in, the, in those formative months between you know when you first get your puppy and you bring them home between eight and 16 weeks, those are the best times. But even if you don't get your puppy at 16 weeks, if you get the, you know, you adopt a two-year-old from the shelter, it means not putting them in situations where their levels are so high that they take a long time to come down. It's about, you know, that desensitization process, using your signals for stop and go, right? My dog gets stressed when a bicycle goes, whizzes by him and he's like, and it, and then it takes him a long time to calm down. Okay, well, how do I desensitize my dog to bicycles? I find a bike path and I sit on a bench or I bring a chair and I sit, 50 meters away. And then I let my dog chew, I give my dog treats, I make sure my dog looks, and then we move forward a meter. How is my dog doing in this situation, right? It's about this forward into stress and backward into recovery, forward into stress, back into recovery. And the recovery period needs to be short and those displacement behaviors need to be low, very few for you to move forward again. Just, I hope that helps. Well, it helped me understand it for sure. Um, the next question here is, uh, some newer research and opinions suggest that there's a fourth fear response for humans, which is fawning or appeasement. Is there any evidence that this exists in dogs as well? Yes, it's, it's probably related to, um, the licking, right? Some of that, that conf that, you know, when they're trying to get more inf information, um, but it's, it's. It's not something that we readily recognize in, in animals. It's um, from all the reading I've done and the, my mentor who, who helps me, we haven't really talked about this a lot. And so I, I think it's one of these things that's probably more human specific. 
maybe it does occur in our pets, but we're not recognizing it um, at this point. Maybe that will change in the future. Right. Makes sense for sure. Um, next question comes from Carol, who's asking, um, do you, do you have any idea of Kevin uh, Bahan and a natural dog training method? He's apparently the author of Your Dog is a Mirror. And do you have any thoughts about it? Sorry, I am not familiar. Um, why don't you, um, if you can give uh, Ben your email, I can do some research on it and then I can, um, I can answer that question for you and get back to you. Okay, great. Uh, that, that's Carol. She definitely has my email, so uh, I'm sure okay. she, we can reach out that way. Yep. Um, the next question here is considering punishment and positive reinforcement, looking to operant conditioning, which is bringing back my animal behavioral days. Is it po both positive and negative punishment to avoid or just positive punishment? Positive and negative punishment. Positive um, and negative reinforcement are are great ways to change. So positive means you know applying something, right? And so, um, so positive reinforcement. You give a dog a treat. If that's the operant part. You're using a tool. It's an operation, right? So you're giving something to the dog to increase to reinforce its behavior. Negative reinforcement means taking something away. So the way to think about it is um, it, we do it a lot in horses, more so than we, than we do with our dogs, but um, think of like a halter on a horse or the halty, the head halter on your dog, right? Pushing into that head halter pushes on their nose. You know, so when they back off of that pressure, it feels better. If you're walking and you just got a new pair of shoes, taking off your shoes, that's negative reinforcement. I removed my shoes, I felt better, right? Those, those two ways are, are a great way to change. Punishment doesn't tell the animal what to do. And so that is where we run into problems because the animal doesn't know what to do. You're just telling them, you're trying to stop something as instead of promoting something. So it's always better to reinforce. Okay. Well, that's a fantastic answer. Um, the next question here comes from Elaine and she's asking, when out on a walk and near other people and dogs, Heather, her dog, will lay down on her back. Does that mean she's receptive to the person and the dog? That's a great question. So maybe or maybe not. So when a dog rolls onto its back, it can be, it fits into that displacement conflict type thing where I don't, I don't want you to kind of come close and, I, and I'm kind of rolling over. Um, when it's to another dog, it is kind of a, a submissive. It can be submissive dog. The relation dominance and submissive is not the same in people and dogs. So we tend, I, I don't use dominance and, and submissive terms um, with behavior because they don't represent our relationship with dogs. They do represent relationships between dogs. Um, but the way to look at it is the position, right? So if your dog rolls over onto his back, but he looks at the person and you've got, you know, especially if they're looking from the side of their eyes, that is a defensive posture. If your dog rolls onto his back and the lips kind of, you know, gravity kind of pulls them away from the mouth and they're relaxed, that's a pet my belly. You know, and so, you know, a dog that that rolls onto their back is more often defensive than a dog that flops and then rolls. So you have to watch their body language and what they're doing. So you're looking for relaxation. But if they're on their back and their head is turned towards them, like they're concerned about what's going on, that dog, that is defensive. That is, I'm not okay with this situation. Okay, that. Fantastic answer. Very, yeah, there's so much to dogs. It's just, it's uh, yeah. good to know exactly what's going on because there's so many little things to look out for. I'm just noticing we are running really close to the end of our session today. So I have a couple of questions written down that uh, if it's okay with you, I'm going to email to you afterwards. And Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm more than happy to answer questions. And um, hopefully, I mean, I'm sure a lot of the trainers that were on this today that they know a lot of this. And so um, hopefully they can help as well. Well, I'm really excited that there were some trainers as well. So thank you for, for coming. And I, I really hope, you know, I mean, we don't, 
we don't learn how to speak dog and dogs don't learn how to speak humans necessarily, but we can both learn from each other. But like I say, now that you know about all these behaviors, don't think your dog is getting worse. They're not. It's just you're better at, at, at picking them out. Well, I will try to keep that in mind as I go watch my dog all night and see That's what right. it's doing. It, it's amazing what you see when you start looking for it, but don't freak out, seriously. Well, thank you again so much for all of your amazing expertise on all of this. I will be uh, emailing you in the future just to get a couple of questions out, and I'll put that on the video and release. If anybody here uh, would like to share this webinar with their friends or their family, we're going to be uploading it onto YouTube. We're also going to be putting on our LinkedIn page and our website. So our website is servicedogresearch.ca and our LinkedIn is the One Health Office of the U of S and Mary Ellen has dropped that in the chat for you all if you want to check it out. Uh, thank you again everyone for coming and thank you so much uh, uh, Karen. Uh, it is it was just such an amazing presentation. I learned so much and uh, a lot of it is going to go into looking at my dog right now. So thank you again and thank you everyone for joining us today. All right, farewell all.